<laughs> what are the, co- the mo- one of the most common objections that you have heard towards apostolic secession? Maybe some of the strongest you would say, and what what would be some of your responses to it? Well, there's a lot of ink that's been spilled on this question over the last 500 years, uh, primarily coming out of, of the Reformation. And I can't claim to have read all of it, but I've read a lot of it over the last 30 years. Um, ranging from Reformed, Lutheran, Catholic, and some Orthodox sources. Um, So I would say there's generally four objections. Um, And the the most fundamental objection is the synonymy claim or Mm. the argument for synonymy. And this was uh, floated at the time of the Reformation um, by Protestant uh, advocates and most famously later on by Stilling Fleet uh, posited the theory that originally presbyters and uh, bishops were an identical office that later on the Episcopate uh, bishops grew out of the presbyterate. And so the claim is grounded on the idea that presbyter and uh, bishop or episcopus and presbyteros or presbyteroi uh, were used are used interchangeably and because they're used interchangeably the reasoning goes they mean the same thing so this is the most this is the linchpin of of modern scholarship since the time of jb lightfoot's famous essay here's if you're interested this is lightfoot's famous essay okay i bought this in oh 19 has a date of like in the 1980s um the christian ministry by jb lightfoot is where he sets out his theory um in the 19th century he also has it in his commentary on philippians and a few other places um he was a a scottish bishop in the church of england um or the british church overall and this work had monumental uh influence on modern scholarship and all the modern literature repeats this almost all the modern literature not all a lot of the modern literature the last hundred years um repeats lightfoot's claim like a mantra and Mm. so to be fair it is the academic scholarship that uh these two terms are synonymous so so it's important though to recognize a couple of things first um academic consensus does not imply truth academic consensus has been wrong in the past so we need to look at the ac- academic consensus can raise the probability of the truth of a proposition, but it depends on how that consensus was achieved. Okay, so let me give you an example. So for much of the 20th century in philosophy, and my background is in philosophy, the dominant philosophy in the English speaking world was that of logical positivism. So these are people like Bertrand Russell, H.J. Ayer, Carnap, the early Wittgenstein, um, if you wanted to get a job in philosophy, you had better, between the 1920s and the 1970s, you had better be a logical positivist, which meant that you thought the meaning of a term, any word, was dependent on whether it could be tied to some sensory phenomena or whether it was true by definition. That is, whether it's synthetic or analytic along the lines of uh, David Hume's philosophy, okay? And consequently, all of metaphysics was considered to be rubbish because it couldn't be tied to anything physical that you sensed, and it wasn't true by definition. Um, Positivism died in the 1970s. Its death really started in 1964 with the uh, publication of Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, for those who are interested, the most widely cross-referenced book out across disciplines in the 20th century. Um, So Kuhn gets kudos for that. But... So how was this consensus of logical positivism created? Well, you had Bertrand Russell, who was certainly a gifted philosopher and intellect. Um, his bibliography of published works is 500, over 500 pages. The bibliography of everything he published is 500 pages. That's a lot of, that's a lot of publishing. Russell takes up a chair uh, in major department, and he's able then, out of um, these school, prestigious schools, to then form all the students who end up getting positions in other major schools. And then we have a thing called World War I, where all the young men of a given generation go off and die. 
So these were a lot of students who went off and died, right, mm. across the continent of Europe. Russell doesn't go, right? A lot of the people he's appointed who have chairs in these departments, they don't go. So they're now they're entrenched even longer. So they're able then to appoint people or recommend people who think like they do. Well, then we have this other thing. We have the second part of World War One called World War II, right? The mm. rematch. And um, more men go and die, right? Another generation of scholars gets completely wiped out. So any dissenting voices are either quashed institutionally or eliminated, right, uh, mm. by the war. So logical positivism this is in large part what contributes to the success now were there objectors to the theory absolutely there were objectors there were objectors in ethical theory in philosophy of language in metaphysics right but they were all pretty much crushed institutionally until somebody came along and said the king doesn't have any clothes on mommy right mm -hmm. and the pressure grew that it, its own advocates recognized that it was not a sustainable project so now in the 1950s it was pretty much a done deal. Logic positivism was, was established philosophical consensus. It was academic consensus and it was wrong. Okay. So I recognize that the, the synonymy claim is, or thesis is academic consensus, but that doesn't make it true. So it's only raises the probability of the truth of the proposition based on academic consensus if the arguments for the academic consensus are good arguments, if they're bad arguments, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's that. So how would I argue against this synonymy claim? And there are other scholars who, who argue this way. Um, interchangeability of terms is a necessary but not sufficient condition for synonymy. What does that mean? That means just because two terms are used interchangeably, it doesn't mean or imply that they mean the same thing, right? It means that there's semantic overlap, that the meaning overlaps, but it doesn't mean that they're coextensive, that they cover all the same cases. So let me give you an give example. Give them a little example, okay, okay. Yeah, here's an example. Take the term um, college and university. Boom. Those are used interchangeably, but they do not necessarily mean the same thing. Now people mm -hmm. can use one for the other, but they're, they're just the interchangeability of terms is not sufficient to show that they mean the same thing. I'll give you another example. Um, legislator and congressman. Those are used interchangeably. Every congressman is a legislator. Is every legislator a congressman? No, because we have senators who are also legislators. Right. So interchangeability of terms does not prove that the terms mean the same thing. You need more than just that. And the problem is you don't get more. You just get this repeated claim over and over and over again mm -hmm. since Lightfoot that um, uh, you, you've got these, uh, you know, these two terms which are which are interchangeable, right? So um, let me let me give you an example. So this is from um, this is from a dissenting scholar uh, from a book, Original Bishops, um, by uh, Alistair Stewart. Um, and he does not hold to episcopacy or apostolic succession. Uh, but on page six of this book, and this came out in 2014, he writes the following, quote, many works moreover repeat the same quote facts or elaborate slightly upon them. I refer here to the synonymy of episcopos and presbyteroi, the emergence of a mono episcopate from a collective presbyterate and the origin of presb presbyteroi in the synagogues. These assertions will be familiar enough to anyone acquainted with the discussion. So often are they made that to cite each occasion on which they are made would unnecessarily swell the footnotes and bibliography with otois citation. All are shown to be baseless, not facts at all, but rather scholarly fictions originating in the learned polemics of the 17th century. Indeed, all are found in Stilling Fleet's work, okay? So you, you get this synonymy claim, which is repeated over and over again, and nobody is thinking through the issues of, of 
well, is this really enough to prove, right, that these terms meant the same? So the, so the reasoning goes like this, that these two terms are used interchangeably. Um, therefore, bishops and presbyters were the same office. Later on, a presbyter who was given distinct authority by the others was elevated to, to what we now call the episcopate over all the rest. And this took a very long time. So all of the resulting arguments that we'll look at all depend on the synonymy claim, with the exception of Jerome's text, and we'll get to that uh, last. So the first thing is you can't prove the synonymy claim, not unless you bring something else linguistically to the table, because interchangeability is not going to be enough. Yeah. Um, secondly, you have biblical examples and express statements that um, the greater blesses the lesser, not the lesser creates the greater. And certainly no man takes an office um, to, to himself. So I don't think that the synonymy claim really works. And I don't think this developmental theory really works. Now, Lightfoot has a developmental theory. Okay. Um, but he thinks episcopacy is clearly established uh, no later than 150 AD. Okay, done, end of deal. And he thinks it was uh, promulgated by John the Apostle. So um, if you want to impugn John the Apostle, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, but that's, but that's Lightfoot's uh, theory. Other people, other Protestant apologists like, um, like Ga Dr. Gavin Ortland, for example, he wants to push this past Cyprian to 250 to 300. I don't think that that's academically or intellectually defensible. Um, I think the evidence uh, at absolute worst, um, even if you take the synonymy claim, uh, it's really not debatable after, after 150 AD. I think Lightfoot's right on that point. Um, but Lightfoot's whole case and the modern case, the consensus depends on the synonymy claim, <clears throat> which they cannot, they cannot prove. Um, so everything rests on feet firmly planted in midair, okay? Um, so the next objection is that initially there are only two orders, uh, not three. And this falls out in part from, from this anonymy claim that you only had bishop, presbyter, bishops, and deacons. And it's true in the New Testament, um, you have an interchangeability of terms. So what, what do I think is going on there? So the term uh, presbyter in the New Testament can function as a collective noun. So when you have a bishop, bunch of bishops together, they're called presbyter, right? And this is actually what Stuart argues in his book. Another possibility is that presbyteros um, or presbyteroi functions like our English term for minister does. It's a generic term. Right. So a deacon is a minister, a presbyter is a minister, a bishop is a minister. But you'd be foolish to say that a bishop is a deacon. Right. right? So um, what I think you have happening in the New Testament in the early apostolic period is something like this. So you have apostles who are directly commissioned by Christ. Then you have other people who are also called apostles, which are commissioned by the apostles. And you see this in Paul's epistles, like Paul always goes out of his way, like to bang you over the head with, I'm an apostle sent by God, right? Not of men, right? Let's get this clear. I was appointed by Jesus Christ himself, not by men, right? Like I didn't even talk to some of the apostles first off, right? Paul is always talking about this. Why? Because we have people like Timothy and Silvanus and Barnabas and others who are not part of the 12 that are called apostles. Right? And they're not just apostles in terms of apostolos being a messenger. They're not just curring messages. They're acting in terms like we see with Timothy uh, in terms of ordaining. And even in First and, Thess First and Second Thessalonians, when you compare the language of the way that Paul groups Timothy and Silvanus in with himself and groups those all as, them all as apostles and refers to themselves in the plural, we apostles. Right. And mm. he's using Timothy and Silvanus in that. Now we start to get a different picture. You have apostles who are ordained by God and you have apostles who are ordained by men. OK. 
And then you have the institution of the first deacons in Acts 6. And then you have uh, the institution of, of bishops. Okay. Now, so we have apostles from God in the early church, apostles of men, bishops, and deacons. But no distinct mention of an office of presbyter. That only happens if you think that the term presbyter is being used to denote an office. But again, that depends on the synonymy claim, which you can't prove. Hmm. So what happens is, of course, the first order apostles die out, right? And they're lieutenants, people like Timothy and Silvanus and Titus. They're going around and establishing churches. And some of them um, are established in different locations. Like they settle down um, in, in Crete and Cyprus and places like this. Okay, so what happens? <clears throat> you have house churches, which will probably have a bishop and a deacon, and they're pretty small groups of people. Okay, and you'll have multiple of these in a given city. So you have a city of maybe 20 to 30,000 people, maybe 15 on the shorter end, 10, but you have house churches pocketing the city. And some of them may not know about each other, right? Because you got to keep things, you know secret right yeah. so what happens <clears throat> well eventually that bishop in that house church is going to die right either natural causes or he's going to get offed right because the romans persecuted they looked for the bishops first because their philosophy was cut off the head of the snake and you know the body will die right so they went after the bishops first they wanted the leadership like they weren't militarily stupid right you 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 degrade the leadership of of your enemy okay so who's going to take over that church <clears throat> can't ordain another bishop on their own so they might merge with another house church right well now you've got a bishop over two house churches and he may not be able to handle both so what he's going to do is he's going to appoint somebody who can minister for him right while he's at this other parish so Lightfoot and other modern scholars are right in thinking, I would argue, that there's a kind of development that takes place, but it's a development in terms of the solidification of an already established order. It's not a principled change of some new order um, being elevated out of a lower order. It's actually a consolidation of the hierarchy and the hierarchy needs to have other things done. So then they bring along presbyters, right? And what are they gonna call them? the generic term. They're a minister. They're not a deacon because they can do things deacons can't do. Okay. So you have that coming from one end. You have a consolidation of, of churches over time towards the end of the first century because the apostles are dying out. You have these second order apostles who are still running around, so to speak. Some of them are being fixed in certain places. Now, if Timothy comes to your town, How, what do you think the prestige is he's going to have compared to the local the local bishop? It's mm -hmm. going to be greater. Right. Right? And he's going to take charge of things. And then he's going to be the bishop over that whole area. Right? So you don't start out with episcopacy as one bishop in one location. What makes episcopacy a bishop monarchial is not that there's one bishop in a given location, it's that only bishops could ordain. That's what mono arche means, single source. There's one source, there's one origin for the order. Presbyters can't ordain, deacons can't ordain, bishops can't ordain, right? So that I think is what's, what's going on. And that's why you see a transition. That's why when you get to Ignatius, you've got these three orders already firmly in place, bishops, presbyters, and deacons, right? Because you have a consolidation, <clears throat> excuse me, of the existing structure. And that this is why also there's no debate about um, mono-episcopacy as a development because you had second order apostles who would move in and take over an area as the, as the first order apostles died. And you would have the death and elimination of house church bishops, and you have congregations that over time, as persecution would wax and wane, they would end up becoming consolidated. So I think 
<clears throat> that explains very easily why there were two orders, just bishops and deacons mentioned very early. And later on with Ignatius, um, you get bishops, presbyters, and deacons. You get a three threefold office. Uh, so does that, does that make sense to you? Do, do you understand kind of what I'm pointing out here? Do you have any questions about that? No, no it, it, it makes sense. It, it, it brings up the question, though, for, for, for us, um, when, when we think about how um, our own apostolic succession undergirds so much of what we teach and believe and, and, and how we approach heterodox confessions and things like that. Uh, I remember a couple of weeks ago, I forget exactly when uh, Justin referred to it um, a moment ago, uh, that someone said to me, you know, you, you can't prove the Orthodox Church has apostolic succession. Perry, how do you respond to that? Well, <clears throat> can I just jump back for a minute? Because there were two other objections I want to hit really quick. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. And then, oh, sure. I'll, and, then I'll, and then I'll jump on that. So... <clears throat> Real quickly, the other claim is that the early church had a plurality of ministers or elders. An elder is just a translation of the term for presbyter, right? Um, and presbyter has a wide range of meaning. It can just mean the senior men in age in a given location. It doesn't necessarily pick out an office. But even if it did, we can just point out, look, a plurality of, of ministers in a given area does not imply a plurality of presbyters as Presbyterians or Congregationalists assume. They need to prove that. And I don't think they can. Secondly, monoepiscopacy is compatible with the plurality of bishops in a location. <clears throat> we can easily have, and you do have cases of, you have a diocesan bishop who has a suffragan bishop, right? That is other bishops who assist him in his jurisdiction. There's nothing wrong with that, right? There's no principal reason why that can't be the case. You also have what are called coadjutor bishops, where you have bishops who split a jurisdiction, right? And they can they can minister in each other's jurisdiction sacramentally. So monoepiscopate is not limited to the idea that you have only one bishop in one locale. That's not even true today. It certainly doesn't need to be true in the first and second centuries. So the plurality of ministers really doesn't cut against apostolic succession or episcopacy at all. The last objection is there's a text from Jerome, and this is the favorite text that um, Protestants, particularly of a classical yeah. Reformation tradition, like to use. Yeah, I saw a couple of videos on that one. <clears throat> yeah, um, I don't think it works, and I'll just run through it. Basically, what Jerome is dealing with, and Ambrosiaster is also dealing with the same situation. And so, Father, this will this will ring a bell to what we were discussing before the show came on. So, in the city of Rome, the city was divided into certain precincts, and the deacons were assigned each. Precincts. So there was a fixed number of deacons in, in Rome in the early church. And this was not just in Rome, this was in other places as well. But the bishops were chosen not from the presbyters, but from the diaconate. So this is why many popes of Rome started, were initially deacons in the city of, of Rome. Okay. Mm. So <clears throat> in the canons of Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea in 325, as well as the time of Jerome and Ambrosiaster, you have deacons who are, shall we say, a little uppity, okay? <laughs> they are getting served communion before the presbyters, okay? And um, some of the deacons in the city of Rome, Ambrosiaster reports, and Jerome is contemporary with Ambrosiaster, um, are claiming that deacons are superior to presbyters, okay? That's, that's the issue. And what Jerome and Ambrosiaster write is that bishops and presbyters form a single ministry, and the only difference is that bishops can ordain and presbyters can't. So what Jerome says is that bishops and presbyters are the same, okay? That is, only they can offer the Eucharist. That's, that's the point. Now, what you have is you have people like Dr. Ortland and others who seize on that text, and they leave out the qualifying phrase, what is the difference between a bishop and a presbyter except that bishops can ordain? They leave out that line, mm. okay? And they ignore the historical context of what Jerome and Ambrosiaster and the Council of Nicaea were dealing with, right? They're not you claiming that's intentional? That, I, I don't know. I, I do know that one of the books that, um, that Ortland relies on is this book um, by Sullivan, From Apostles to Bishops, okay? 
this is a Catholic scholar. He tends to be left-leaning Catholic scholar. And from what I can tell, uh, Dr. Ortland is cribbing text out of this and he leaves off the qualifying phrase. So I'm not sure if Dr. Ortland has read the primary text and mm. chosen to leave off that qualifying phrase, or he just took it from just a secondary right. source and didn't so. check it. I don't, I don't know. And I'm not trying to impugn ill motives. Sure. I'm just saying it looks like a mistake. Okay. Um, the other thing that I think is important to notice about Jerome's text is Jerome there and in a couple other places in some of his letters dealing with this issue um, says, has a hypothesis about how the distinction between bishop and presbyter took place. And what he says is during the time of the apostles, before I believe the writing of Paul's letters to the Corinthians or about that time, which would be around 50 to 55 AD, okay? Um, in order to <clears throat> eschew or prevent schism, the apostles decided that um, one presbyter should be above all the rest. And that's how Jerome says bishops came to be uh, among over presbyters. OK, and so uh, Dr. Ortland and others want to make the claim. We'll see. This is uh, this is proof that it wasn't divinely instituted. It wasn't instituted by Christ. OK, there's a number of problems with with this claim. First, Dr. Orlin wants to claim that this is something that happened in the 200s or so. But Jerome says it happened when the apostles are alive and the apostles all agreed to it. Mm. OK, so if you want to say all the apostles are wrong and contradict all the apostles, I can't stop you. Right. right. Like to me, that's a done deal. Um, he's also shifted. Initially, he said that you know, Episcopacy wasn't instituted by Christ, and then he changed his language. It wasn't divinely instituted. And I think this is important because Protestants can't show that if you hold the synonymy claim, they can't show you anywhere where Christ instituted bishops, or presbyters, right? So if they want to hold that it wasn't directly instituted by Christ, well, then their church government theory also goes out the window because they have no text to show Christ instituted the Presbyterian model or the, the congregational model either. Um, so those are, those are two fundamental points, I think, that Dr. Ortland and others miss. This is something that took place within the New Testament. It isn't a later development. It, ex it would explain why um, there is uh, no controversy. Uh, it was universal agreement among all the apostles, uh, according to Jerome. Now, the issue... The further issue is this with Jerome's text. Um, Jerome is writing in the late fourth century. He doesn't cite any sources for this at all. Okay. Um, this is his hypothesis. <coughs> we do have earlier sources um, like Irenaeus, like Eusebius. And, and Eusebius is important here on this point because Eusebius says that he was given access to both ecclesiastical records at major churches and do imperial records. So when he writes his history of the church, he says up front, he has access to these things. Okay. And he cites hmm. Irenaeus, he right. cites Tertullian, he cites a number of other people who are even earlier than him. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, Dr. Ortland in his presentations won't accept this from Irenaeus. He says he wants a source earlier than, or excuse me, he won't accept it from Eusebius. He wants a source that's earlier. But when it comes to Jerome, Jerome is even much later than Eusebius, and he has no problem accepting Jerome's hypothesis, even though Jerome gives you no sources whatsoever. And Eusebius does. Eusebius gives you sources stretching back to 150 AD. And so we got this kind of special pleading going on with the, with the Jeromean text. Um, but even at, even if we are were to accept Jerome's uh, text at face value of being an actual historical record, it says it was instituted by the apostles. And so this puts uh, Dr. Ortland and other Protestants in the position of rejecting long before the completion of the New Testament canon, rejecting the teaching of all the apostles. Um, I, I don't see how that really helps their uh, position. So... Um, Father, you had asked, um, you know, people who say, you know, you can't prove, um, 
you know, the Orthodox have apostolic succession and how, how would I respond to that? Right. Um, uh, well, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I asked that earlier. Right. Yeah. So to jump on that, I would say the first thing is the person who makes the claim bears the burden of proof. So if they're claiming I can't prove it, then they now have the burden to prove that I can't prove it. I don't think they want to phrase it that way. I think they want to ask, can it be proven or can it be demonstrated? Um, I think it also depends on who is making the claim, not in a kind of ad hominem way, but in terms of what perspective they're making it from. So, for example, if I'm dealing with an atheist, right, or who's a, like a metaphysical naturalist, right, they don't think that God exists or anything beyond matter, time, uh, matter, energy in a time space context. Well, there are wider issues there why they they think I can't prove it because they don't think the supernatural exists, as opposed to like a Presbyterian or a Calvinist, right, or a Lutheran. Um, there are going to be different reasons why they think that it's not provable. So I think it, we need to get clear on what perspective they're coming from. Um, first, I would say directly, we have historical record of ordinations um, going back centuries, all the way into the first century. So um, if they're going to reject those lists, they're going to need to give us reasons why. Because in historiography, tie goes to the runner. The person who recorded it was there. They had access to information. So unless you have a good reason to say that they're not historically reliable, then you can't just reject them out of hand. And remember, reliability does not mean 100% accuracy. Reliability means it's true more often than not. Okay? So we need a reason to reject those Episcopal lists. And some of these lists, you can go look at them on the internet, right? They're publicly accessible, which, of course, was one of the arguments that the early apologists made for Christianity over against the Gnostics. All of our ordinations are publicly known. They're discernible. The church is knowable. You can go here and see where the church is, right? So I think the, the lines of succession are historical data. And furthermore, the way we know it is the same way we know about um, authorship of the Gospels through historical testimony. So if we're going to reject the testimony of Irenaeus and Tertullian and Origen and all these other people as historical figures, then we need to reject their testimony also for the authorship of the Gospels, right? Uh, and that's part of the problem overall with a lot of the contemporary academic methodology. So people will read um, people will read books like uh, um, Stewart's book, which I had mentioned or they will uh, read um, uh, Raymond Brown, who, who was a kind of left-leaning Catholic scholar, but I mean, he was, a, he was an important Catholic scholar. Um, and they will say, well, they don't believe in apostolic session. They think this can't be historically defended and so on and so forth. Yeah, but they're dating things so late and denying apostolic authorship in order to do it. So Stuart, for example, doesn't think that Paul wrote... Um, a number of works ascribed to him in the New Testament, which is why he's able then to construct this developmental theory, right? Of this is a much later addition, right? It's this kind of developed mythology. Well, if you were to if you were to ascribe Timothy and Titus and um, these other works to Paul, as traditionally is done, that is, if you're conservative in in your dating and authorship for the New Testament, well, the case for the for apostolic succession becomes that much stronger. Right. So right. they can only make these cases like they will refer to the literature, but leave out the fact that um, these all require very late dating and denying of divine inspiration and denying of apostolic authorship, which they won't accept on their own grounds for their own theology. So it, it's kind of a double standard at that point. So I, I would point to we, we know we know apostolic succession is true by the same way we know uh, that the apostles wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other works of the New Testament. If people want to reject that, then you know that's fine, but they're going to have to reject the New Testament as well. Um, so in general, that's how I would respond to that that kind of line of argumentation or, or reasoning or, or just flat out claim. No, that's a Thank that's you, a good one. Sorry, Father. No, go ahead. I was, 
No, I was just saying, no, that that's a that's a really great response. Um, I like that. I wanted to I wanted to throw this this one at you. This, so this is an objection. I'm sure for how long you've been in this uh, in this work, in this kind of work, you've heard this before. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of people that don't have who, you know, a lot of certain groups that don't have apostolic succession. They would say, well, what about that text that we read in the Gospels that says whoever isn't against us is for us? And, and usually that's a reference, I think, to, you know, in the Gospel of Mark and I think in Luke's Gospel as well. Um, but I've heard Protestant apologists uh, parrot this one before, and they use that as a proof text to kind of make a defense for their denomination, even though they don't have apostolic succession mm -hmm. or hold to the ancient practices. How would you respond to this uh, defense of theirs? Yeah, I, I think the first thing is to recognize what the concept of denomination is and, and what it isn't. And because this is a term that's flown around, the concept of a denomination is a late 19th century development from Protestantism. It's a Protestant idea. OK, so it assumes a Protestant ecclesiology. So I don't grant that assumption from the get go. So the idea of denomination is all the Protestants agree on sola fide and sola scriptura and one or two other things. And so it's a model to explain how these Protestant churches could all be um, have some form of unity in doctrine without organizational unity. OK, well, the Orthodox Church is not a denomination. We're, we're pre-denominational, we're pre-Reformation and we're not a Protestant body. So we're not a denomination. Um, so that's the first thing to put out. You don't get to assume your whole ecclesiology without argument just because you slip in one term, okay? Um, secondly, the text does not say whoever says they are a minister is a minister, okay? The text doesn't say that, and the text is not expressing that idea. Um, the text doesn't say whoever is for us is a minister, and whoever is against this is not. It doesn't say that. Um, and this is compatible with uh, classical Protestant readings uh, and ecclesiology. Classical Protestants don't think that just because you say you're a minister, you're a minister. There's a whole process. You have to be called, right, Same. by the presbytery. You have to go through training, you, right? You have to be uh, elected. Good point. <laughs> right? So they don't accept this idea that anybody who says they're a minister is a minister. That's a view we share in common with the classical reformers. Mm. Okay? So Pastor Bobby or Jim Bob or Pastor Chuck or someone else says, <laughs> I feel called by the Lord and I'm a minister. Oh, well, no, you ain't. No, no <laughs> offense, but you ain't. You, you aren't a minister. Again, scripture says no man takes the office to himself. Right? Nowhere in the Bible does somebody just stand up and say, I'm commissioned by God with no divine verification. Right? Um, that's why the question is, who sent you? Jesus says, as the Father sends me, so I send you. Okay, so who sent these other ministers? Well, they're sent by God. Okay, how do you know they're sent by God? Because they say so. That, that's it. They just need to say so. Where is that in the New Testament? That's not in the New Testament. Okay, so um, the other thing that we need to look at is this. Um, for example, with, with Presbyterians. Um, the Reformed and Presbyterian deny that ordination conveys a real spiritual gift and authority. Okay, so we have people, and I'm not trying to pick on uh, Dr. Ortland here, but we have people like Dr. Ortland who says, well, I'm an ordained minister. I have apostolic succession too because it comes through the presbyterate or whatever, right? I'm in historical continuity with those people. Well, I don't think and he's aware. Said that, by the way, yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's aware of the fact that his tradition denies that ordination, the laying on of hands, is necessary to be a minister, um, or that ordination actually conveys the the, um, the laying on of hand conveys a real spiritual gift and authority to be a minister. But um, if you read Reformed ecclesiology, they're very clear that that idea died with the apostles. That power died with the apostles. It's no more. It doesn't exist in the church anymore. That's their position. That's not my position. That's their position. So even if this proof text were legitimizing other ministers outside the apostolic band, 
they would still need to meet the New Testament teaching that ordination conveyed a real spiritual gift and power. But they deny that, which is why I said earlier, I, I'm glad, you know, I'm happy that classical Protestants affirm that their ordinations do nothing. Right. They convey nothing. They're just laymen who are elected to a particular office. So if you read, for example, the first book of church order from the, the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, it flat out says that laying on hands is not necessary to be a minister. Now, they changed it later on, but they didn't say that it was necessary. They just include that laying on hands. But they have ministers um, who are not ordained. They've never had hands laid on them. Right. They don't think it's necessary because they don't think it, it does anything because um, they don't think it's a sacrament. So I would want to know what these people think makes a minister of the gospel. According to the New Testament. So we'll, we'll play the Sola Scriptura game. Well, Show Perry, me. this kind of brings up. A, yeah, I just want to cut in here because you, you, you bring up something that that. I think is a, a very firm Protestant doctrine, and I, I may be mispronouncing it, but uh, you mentioned it a moment ago, how they deny everything kind of stopped back when the apostles all died. So uh, is this a cessationism? Well, cessationism? There's a cessationist in the Protestant Yeah, it yeah, has a wider yes. application. Uh, my understanding is cessationism has a, a wider application that is a form of cessationism. And, and really what the Protestants are doing is they are trying to cut off claims of the Church of Rome at, at the knees, right? Mm -hmm. The Pope can't be a successor to the apostles if none of the bishops are successor to the apostles and you're just layman, okay? The, the problem is this, and it gets to two issues, one issue in sacramentology and the other issue in Christology. OK, and the, the first comes from the second. So Reformed Christology, uh, Reformed uh, Sacramentology looks like this. OK, so you have the bread and the wine, let's say, for the Eucharist. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you are elected, predestined by God, if you're one of the, 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 the chosen. OK, mm -hmm. um, when you receive the elements of bread and wine. OK, with faith, because you're elect, you've been regenerate. At that same point, you receive spiritual benefits, okay? And these spiritual benefits are virtues that have been given to or perfections in the flesh of Christ. Now, since in the Reformed world, Christ is up in heaven and Christ's flesh can't be omnipresent, not that the real presence requires that view, but they think it does. Um, you can't actually have Christ's flesh, but what you can have are virtues or benefits that are taken from Christ's flesh, glorified flesh, and given to your soul at the moment you receive the bread and the wine. This is called virtualism, okay? So you can be said to receive the body and blood of Christ because you're receiving the virtues of the body and blood of Christ, okay? So it's a kind of synecdoche or a way of speaking, right? And so what you have is kind of conti uh, contiguity. You have two things happening sacramentally at the same time but they're not interconnected you have the outward elements given the bread and wine and at the same time if you're elect you have um the benefits of christ's body and blood and they'll talk about this as a spiritual presence okay that's how they understand the sacraments there's an outward and inward element that are joined by an act of divine will okay and this is a product of their defective christology um from Vermigli and Calvin and others, where you have Christ, the person of Christ, the, who is a legal person, of whom God the Word is a subset. And this is known as the extra Calvinisticum, okay? That um, God the Word, the second person of the Trinity, is not strictly identical to the person of Christ, but they're joined by an act of will. That's why they take the communication of idioms in, in Christology to be synecdoche, right? It's just, you can say that God died, but God didn't really suffer a human death, okay? The man suffered a human death. And you can see this in Vermigli's uh, lectures on the two natures of Christ. He's very clear about it. And he's getting it from Theodoret of Cyrus, who of course was an associate of Nestorius, by the way. 
So that's what's going on in the background. The problem is when they come to ordination, they already deny that ordination is the sacrament, the reformed half. So they can't even use that contiguity model for that. They just say that we're assured that God, you know, um, blesses people who are ordained. Well, you're sure? You're sure about that? Like, because number one, you can't appeal to election because just because somebody's ordained doesn't mean that they're elect, right? Because there's no outward sign for election, right? It's invisible and it's secret. It's known only to God. You can't even know that you're elect, right? So much for assurance of salvation. But um, there's no reason to think that ordination is actually doing anything or God's doing anything for the ordinance because um, you deny that laying on a hands is necessary or that it conveys anything else. And you have no way of knowing that God is actually or ordaining that person at all or blessing them in any way. So um, I think this is the big problem for classical Protestants who are, I, I agree are more intellectually rigorous than your, your Pastor Bobby guy or Pastor Jim Bob or whoever. Um, but I think it's a problem for both of them. Who sent your ministers? How do you know they're ministers? Just because they say so, right? Like, isn't that the definition of a hireling, Ooh. right? Of an imposter, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, somebody who presumes to take the office to themselves. Um, so I think that's really what's going on. And the problem is the reformed are stuck uh, because their sacrament, uh, sacramental theology really won't allow them to affirm even that there's a contiguity of blessing uh, in ordination. So I think I think that's how I would address that question about, um, you know, whoever is not against us is for us. There, there's nothing in the text that says this is a qualification for ministry or a sufficient condition for ministry or make somebody a, a, a minister. Right, right. No, that's a that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. You you brought up a really strong case. I know a second ago you were saying you were playing this sola scriptura game. If you want to finish that thought, please do. <laughs> well, I mean, if if we're going to limit ourselves to scripture, fine. Um, where in scripture does it express how ministers are made? Right? Do they just pop up out of nowhere? Do you, Does it say that you feel called by God, therefore you're a minister? I, I don't. I don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. I don't see it in the Old Testament. Um, I do see in the Old Testament, like at the rebellion at Korah, people wanting to be ministers that they're not entitled to be and taking the office to themselves. And then God, you know, God kills that really quick. Um, so I would just challenge people where where in Scripture does it teach this idea that you have this inward feeling that you should be a minister or God has called you and therefore you are. I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. So if we just want to go by the Bible, this theory of ministry that people want to try to extract from this gospel text just isn't there. Um, the another side issue is this. If people are preaching heresy, well, are they for us or against us? I think I think they're against us, right? So that just begs the question, right? Like, what is true doctrine at that point, right? If, if you're denying all of these other things, whether they're issues of Trinitarian theology, Christology, or, or the sacraments, or apostolic ministry, well, then you're actually preaching against us. And, you know, here's something else. Don't, don't call the Orthodox idolaters and then use this text. Because <laughs> if we're idolaters and then you're for us, you're with us, well, then you're an idolater too. Wow. Right? So you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. If, if you're going to call us idolaters and non-Christians and, and, and pagans and things like this, which they have and they do, um, and say that we've corrupted the gospel and that we don't have the gospel, well, then you don't get to use this text right. for us. Right. And, and here's an aside. Let, let's make the problem even more acute, okay? The Reformation has roughly three we'll say four traditions. I'll be nice. We have the Anabaptists, which are the children that nobody wants to really own except themselves, right? <laughs> um, then we have the Presbyterian and Reformed, and we have the Lutherans. 
And then we have the Baptists, which are really Anabaptists that cleaned up their act a little bit, less started being, you know, a little less kooky. Right. Um, if you read the early history of the Baptists, I mean, they're just all over the place. It's like reading the early history of TBN or something. Um, <laughs> you got anti-Trinitarianism and all kinds of stuff floating around. Um, now, on Reformation principles, not Orthodox principles, Reformation principles, the three marks of the church are rightly interpreting the word, rightly administering the sacraments, and right administration of church government. That's what makes a visible church on Reformation principles. Okay. Now, the Lutherans do not recognize, they do not formally recognize the Presbyterians or the Baptists as true visible churches. Well, why? They don't rightly divide the word because they reject either infant baptism or baptismal regeneration or Christ's real presence in the Eucharist, according to the Lutherans. Okay. Um, and they don't rightly administer the sacraments, hmm. right? So they fail on those, and they don't have a proper church government. Now, um, so the Lutherans do not accept the, the Presbyterians and Reformed as true visible churches. Um, the Presbyterians do not accept the Baptists as true visible churches because they don't rightly interpret the word, right? Rightly administer the sacraments or rightly have a church government. None of these three traditions have ever formally recognized each other as true visible churches and established formal intercommunion. Now, it's true that if you're an individual member and you're a Lutheran, you can go to a Reformed church and they will probably give you communion if you're a member in good standing. But exceptional cases are not the rule, right? Right. So um, in this way, uh, the problem is more acute. For 500 years, these people have all been claiming sola scriptura, okay? And none of them recognize each other as true visible churches, and none of them have intercommun formal intercommunion with each other. Not, not one. So this whole idea of denominations that we talked about earlier, when you really look at Reformation teaching, it just doesn't work. Because mm -hmm. to be a denomination, you have to be a true visible church. Well, the Lutherans don't think the Presbyterians or Baptists are true visible churches. And the Presbyterians and the Lutherans don't think the Baptists are true visible churches. And the Baptists don't think the Reformed or Lutherans are true visible churches. So the problem is much, much worse for them uh, on their own principles. That's not on Orthodox principles. That's their own theological principles. They fail. Sheesh. Man. So I think in that way, the That's problem like being consistent. Well. well, and this was a problem for me. I was Reformed. <laughs> And I had to face the issue, like I was involved in um, in uh, the organization used to be called Christians United for Reformation. It's now called the Association of Confessing Evangelicals. This was Mike Horton's group, Kim Rodebog, or all these guys. And um, I learned a lot from them. But they as a joint Lutheran Reformed venture. And I'm like, wait, the Lutherans don't have formal intercommunion with us, right? Um, they don't recognize, we're, we failed their test for a true visible church, right? I mean, I used to argue with James White about this because he's always kind of hurt emotionally that the Presbyterians don't want to call the Baptists reformed because they don't, they don't have the same covenant theology. Like, if you really want to upset a bat, reformed Baptist, tell them that they're not really reformed and just watch what happens. I mean, it's like the 4th of July. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but they don't want to talk about that. Right. But that's the real issue is the reform don't accept. Uh, I mean, go ask our, uh, Scott Clark of Westminster Seminary, teaches historical theology. Ask him if the reform, Reformed Baptists are really Reformed or not. Watch what happens. He'll say flat out they're not. Hmm. So this is why a lot of this is just illusory, oh, wow. this unity that they supposedly have. It's illusory because in the New Testament, what is the mark of unity? Right. See the Eucharist. The Eucharist. Yep. Who you eat with. They won't eat, even eat at each other's tables in terms of the Lord's table. Right. Even <laughs> it's funny you say that. So I, I was, uh, somebody, am I getting feedback? Um, you, you guys hearing feedback from me? Not anymore. No, you're fine. Okay. Well, you have the LCMS and um, another Lutheran group, like within the same, like they hold to the same confessional documents, but yet like, they won't even have commune with each other, you know, and that that's just wild to me. Like I've even I've even asked this to a Lutheran pastor 
And man, when I tell you just the the dodging and flipping and it's it's wild, man. You know, it's it, it just makes no sense to me. Like, hey, okay, you guys hold to Sola Scriptura, you guys hold to the Book of Concord. Why right. won't you commune together? You know, right. And I'm not saying that there aren't there may not be substantial theological issues between, say, the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans and the Missouri Synod Lutherans or something like this. But, you know, you hold to the same confession, like what needs to be, how much more specific do you need, do you <laughs> need to be? Like how, how narrow is, do you think the faith is? Um, right. So in any case, I, I, I just don't think that, that that whosoever is not, you know, against this is for us. It, it doesn't do any work. Uh, Makes sense. Gary, I want to I want to thank you for earlier in your talks uh, and in your answering of our questions, mentioning Dr. Gavin Ortland because he has uh, made some some wildly uh, egregious videos, clearly misrepresenting our church, our faith, and so forth. And you've addressed a, a, a great deal of that today regarding apostolic succession. One of the things that he said in in a, a video that we refuted on one of our earlier episodes here with Father John Whiteford, is he put out this video about, you know, I forget what it was, three reasons or five reasons you should become uh, or, or you should stay Protestant. And right. he presents Protestantism as, as this, um, this group of people who all believe the same things and, and so forth and so on and are very unified and so forth. And as you just pointed out, that is not the case. And anybody who looks at Protestantism today and studies Protestantism sees that th there there is no unity there, as, as they sometimes claim there is. And they often point to us and say, well, you guys are exclusive and you you won't let us fellowship with you and, and, and things like that. We do have a, kind of a, a claim to exclusivity. Um, but how would you address someone who says to us, um, you know, you don't have any any exclusive Orthodox ecclesiology that that we don't share in part or in whole. Um, th that is an issue with some people, our exclusivity. But we kind of proudly stand on that, uh, wouldn't you say? Or or um, is it more nuanced than that? Well, I, I would about the exclusivity objection. I call this the mean objection uh, because yeah, essentially we're, we're mean. Yeah. yeah, we're mean and 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 nasty people. Um, because you know, we, you know, we have we have borders and lines and things like this. Uh, we have principles that makes us mean we have boundaries. Yeah. Yes, or be so. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's a couple things that's going on. I think as Protestant evangelicalism, popular evangelicalism dissolves, which is what we're seeing now, particularly along the lines of sexual yes. ethics. Okay, among other issues. Um, this is starting to completely fracture in, in ways that were unimaginable 30, 40 years ago. And that sounds like a long time for some of your viewers, but it's not a long time. Just wait, it'll, it'll happen. Um, and I think there's a strong intuition, <clears throat> and I see this at my own parish. I'm sure, Father, you see it at yours, and Luther, you see it at yours. There are people who are just like, I'm done. I'm done with Pastor Jim Bob and mm. whatever he happens to to come across, I need something that's not going to change. Orthodox refugees. Right. And I understand that. And now, on the one hand, I want to say that that intuition should not be the sole basis of making a decision. If you're college educated, you need to take your time and make an informed decision. Mm. Um, so you need to, uh, to wax Pauline study and show thyself approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, but one who's rightly dividing the word of truth. So you need to take your time. I'm sympathetic with people with those intuition. So I think what happened is people are moving in that direction. Um, they're reading the epistles of Ignatius and things like this. And they're saying, look, this does not look like Luther or Calvin or John you know, Smith, who was the founder of the Baptists who ordained himself and 40 other people. Um, I, I don't know how you baptize yourself, but uh, in any case, I think people are just at that done point. And so I think what Dr. Ortland is doing is kind of damage control. The problem though, is that he's a reformed Baptist. He's not really a, a popular evangelical. So he really needs to defend a, re a distinctively reformed view. And for people who are not as theologically literate coming from the evangelical world, 
um, that's going to be a harder sell. So that's why he shifted to why you should remain Protestant, as if there's this general notion of what constitutes Protestant. Now, I understand they want to affirm unity on sola scriptura and sola fide, which were the two principal issues of the Reformation. Um, but those have a whole lot of other entailments, hmm. right? Um, which they do not all agree about. And again, they, as we said before, they don't um, have inner communion. So don't tell me you're all you're all part of the same church in principle if you don't have communion with each other. Right. Um, with respect directly to Orthodox exclusivity, it is true. We do not have open communion. Um, and I think that's for good reason, because communion indicates an expression of a common faith, which we do not have with these other people. Um, I understand, I understand. that at, th at Thanksgiving dinner or at Christmas dinner with relatives, um, it can be awkward and it can be it can seem unfriendly. Um, you know. But it's not false just because it makes people uncomfortable. Right. So right. the analogy that I give, and some people may have heard this before, is let's suppose you're at the first you're in the first century, right? So you're at, I don't know, Thessaloniki or Crete or some church in the New Testament, and uh, you're in town and, you know, your town's got 15,000 people. So it's a good size city um, and uh, by ancient standards. And you meet somebody who's a Christian and they don't go to your particular congregation. So you're like, hey, you know, uh, Fred, uh, I haven't seen you at the Eucharist or the later agape after the Eucharist. Is there another house church I don't know about, bro? Like, what's <laughs> and 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 Fred says, um, no, I, I disagreed with Paul about certain interpretations of the Old Testament, so I created my own church. I, I felt called by God, and I created my own church. Now, you would not accept that in the New Testament period. Yeah. Why would you accept that now? Exactly. Why would you accept that now? But people do. Um, because they have this kind of X-Files ecclesiology that the church is just this mystical thing out there that you just magically tap into, right? Which it's it's kind of docetistic, right? It's it's just kind of, you know, Christ was never incarnate, right? He never really ordained actual people. The church is not this public entity. So I don't think it's that the church is trying to be cruel or mean. It's that this is the faith that we have received and we think is biblical. And these are the lines that we think are, are are in accordance with that and delivered from from christ and his apostles the second thing is as i noted earlier classical protestants are exclusionary also unless you're mm -hmm. a unitarian mm -hmm. and even they are exclusionary there was this uh few years ago i read about this witch who was excommunicated from a unitarian church um and i'm like wow that that takes some doing to get the unitarians to kick you out like you must be really bad um so i i think everyone is exclusionary the lutherans will not generally accept um they don't accept open communion with other reformed bodies and that's with agreement on sola scriptura and and sola fide so everybody is exclusionary and furthermore um you know these are the people if you want to complain about exclusionary being exclusive um you don't get to call us idolaters you don't get to call us Mary worshipers. You don't get to call us, you know, right. people who have lost the gospel, who do not have the gospel. Just because we don't have your particular understanding of, you know, faith as an empty virtue and things like this, um, you, you can't have it both ways. Either we're part of the true church or we're not. So you need to pick one, please. So I really don't think that the position is consistent. I don't think it's historically informed. I mean, Good Lord, um, during the time of the of the um, the English Civil War, uh, you know, you have James Charles Charles James. Um, the Presbyterians and the Baptists were calling each other Antichrist. They were anathematizing each other, and that's for a long period. Like for the Baptists, the whole si system of Presbyterian government was Antichrist. It was on like. Like the Pope had friends now as Antichrist, right? From a Baptist perspective. Um, let's not pretend that that wasn't real, that that wasn't real history. And there's nothing in principle that's changed between them. It's just that the social political order changed and the Baptists weren't at the short end of the political stick. 
right? And we have a secular government now, right? And so, you know, that's why things have calmed down to some extent. There are other causes, but let's not pretend that you were all frenzies before and weren't exclusionary. I mean, they were torturing each other, right? Mm. And that's Baptists and Presbyterians, right? So I just think it's based on an illusion. Um, everybody's exclusionary. Everybody draws lines somewhere. Um, people, what, what's really at issue pastorally, I think, is people want to are drawn to orthodoxy and they want to feel like they can be part of it, but they can't go the whole way. And so when you say that they are outside the church, that seems to invalidate their claim to experience divine grace. Mm. Okay. And that's what I think is really going on is they feel emotionally excluded. They're drawn to the church, but they want to accept the orthodoxy on their terms. They want to have an icon because it looks cool. They want, you know, to be included. And I understand that need. That's a real sociological need. Humans are social animals. I, I understand that. Um, but it doesn't make it true just because your feelings get hurt. Right. Right. Um, it, the, the other thing is, I mean, the Protestant Bible? ecclesiology is... Uh, Father out here ordering pizza? I, I think it's Dr. Ortland calling. <laughs> He's like, I hear it. <laughs> Um, oh, man. Hey, welcome to St. John, the Theologian Orthodox Church. There's nobody here. Are you kidding, Father? Take your call. Your call is very important to us, so please leave your name. Uh, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Go, go, continue. Yeah, there. I, I think um, I, something people are, you know, one, I would tell them, send complaints to Jesus. If the Orthodox Church is Jesus' church, then complain to Jesus, because he set it up. Um last thing I would say on that point is Protestant ecclesiology is not the default assumption. You don't get to assume your whole ecclesiology without argument or demonstration and then use it as a measuring rod for our position. You don't get to do that, uh, especially when you guys are 1,500 years too late. When, when you're the Johnny come lately, you, you don't get to do that, right? It's kind of like Mormons, and I'm not comparing Protestants to Mormons, but it is analogous or similar to Mormons complaining that we won't give them the name Christian. Well, the word has meaning in terms of historical usage. You don't get to change it just because you don't, right? We don't think the definition fits, right? You don't get, word meaning doesn't work that way. Like it, word meaning has histor history of usage and it doesn't change just because you don't, you want to now use it in some way, right? Um, in that way, word meaning is is more of a public thing than it is like some beetle in the box private thing. So, yeah, I mean, that's the way that I would answer. And so I'd invite people to think about if they were in the New Testament church, how this idea of individual invisible churches uh, or an invisible church of which there's some competing visible church, how that would actually work. If that's really the New Testament model, I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah. I know uh, a second ago we we said uh, uh, Dr. Gavin called uh, Father Jonathan's line to file a complaint, <laughs> um, but on a serious note, like we're not. So this is not a pick on Dr. Gav show. Like we have a, like a lot of respect for him, but I know he's made videos on this topic. And so mm -hmm. you know this question I'm going to ask. It's not personal. I like sure. I like Dr. Gavin. He's great. You know what I mean. Um, you know this is just because he's he's doing this kind of work and it comes with the territory um but he 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 mentioned in one of his videos uh that the office of a bishop is a later development and i wanted to get your thoughts on that like that that is um i mean he's made a couple of objections but he thinks that you know the office of bishop is a later development which we've talked about in you know uh as we walked you know went through this video but why is this not even an objection that this is a letter a later development um and wh why doesn't this hit home can you kind of speak more to that yeah as i intimated earlier development as a term can pick out lots of different things so we need to be clear about what he's trying to express as as development mm -hmm. what he seems to be and i've watched all his videos 
today and as a shameless plug um i have about six plus hours of content coming out where i go through everything on all his videos Ooh, so everything what people are seeing here is just a summary just a of, taste <laughs> yeah i got it i got a 60 page outline so that's wow. gonna take take me about six hours um to record and get all that up and running so if people are interested when i get that up they can go and look for like if they really want to be bored to tears and all the minutia <laughs> right and you know crying uh we're linking. hours and hours they can, they can go watch that uh, i'm not here to entertain you i'm, I'm here to, <laughs> i'm here to teach so if you're not entertained too bad um so to, to tackle this i think he means by development that there were some kind of presbyterian type structure I mean, it's not clear whether it's Presbyterian or Congregational because he's a Baptist. Um, but basically, there were two orders, Presbyter and Deacon. And over time, a particular uh, Presbyter was singled out, given more honor. And then this kind of, from generation to generation to generation, morphed into this particular Presbyter having oversight over everybody else. So what he's taken is Lightfoot's theory and extended it. And he's used modern, uh, let's say, liberal-leaning biblical scholarship to do this. So his account stretches it not from as a hard number, 150 AD, which is what Lightfoot said. And Lightfoot says in his book that it came from John the Apostle. Um, <clears throat> but he stretches it out to 250 to, to, to 300 AD. So he thinks that what we call a bishop today really didn't exist till between 250 to 300 AD, because he says that he argues that even, I believe, Cyprian, who's in that 200 uh, range, didn't even have in mind what we call a bishop. So what I would say to that, first, all of this depends on the synonymy claim, which they can't prove. Two, it depends on late dating and a denial of apostolic authorship for a number of New Testament books, as we indicated before. Um, furthermore, the um, what really, what we need to ask, and I think he's asking the wrong question. Um, he's asking, when did monarchical episcopate in terms of a single bishop in a given location become the fixed norm? That's, that's not re what's necessary for apostolic succession. What's necessary is that you have three orders of ministers and only bishops can ordain. Mm. Okay. So, um, if, the principles that I set out before at the beginning are all true, regardless of whether there's a plurality of bishops in a given location or not. That's all we need for apostolic succession, right? And and this is part of the other problem that I noted that his position is really inconsistent because he wants to say, and he talks as if he thinks ordination conveys spiritual gift, but his own history, his own tradition and the wider reform tradition flat out denies this. So I don't think he's really familiar with the reformed position on this point. He he's arguing for a position that really he's got to choose between the Bible. If he thinks the Bible teaches that ordination conveys spiritual gift, then he's got to choose the Bible over the reformed tradition. Now, if you want to say the reformed tradition is wrong, okay, great. Reformed tradition is wrong. I'm with you there, right? <laughs> um, but if he wants to go with reformed tradition and say that's biblical and the Bible really doesn't teach that then he's got to contradict his earlier statements which very clearly or at least to me seem to express the idea that he thinks ordination actually conveys spiritual power and authority to be a minister but the reformed tradition uh denies this which is why ordination by laying on hands has been optional for them so um i i don't think that if you take a conservative view of the authorship of the new testament and it's divine inspiration. Um, and you and if you can't prove the synonymy claim that Dr. Orton and other scholars uh, fall flat. And this is something interesting to me because um, the book by uh, Alistair Stewart, um, the, uh, the original bishop's book, you can see that. Mm. Um, he references this book. Um, the three books that he claims to have read on the topic are, are all here. The Raymond Brown book, the Sullivan book, and the Stewart book. Um, these are the three books he claims to have read uh, on the topic. 
I think it's a little premature to make a judgment based on just reading three books, but fine. Here's the problem. Stewart's book, as I cited earlier when I read that, that snippet, I think from page six, um, the whole first chapter is devoted to demonstrating that the synonymy claim is false. Okay. This book is essentially a revival of Edwin Hatch's thesis that bishops were local laymen who had um, administrative uh, and financial responsibilities. Now, I don't agree with Stuart or Hatch, but here's the issue. Dr. Ortland uses this book to argue against apostolic succession, but he completely ignores all the arguments that Stuart gives against his own position. Now, wow. if you just watch Dr. Ortland's videos, you would think Stuart agreed with him. Mm. But the entire first chapter of this book is devoted against Lightfoot's uh, thesis. And it's all throughout the rest of the book. I've read the entire, like, I read the entire book. Uh, right. So, you know, I just think that that falls under the fallacy of stacking the deck and cherry picking, mm. right? Like, you need to tell your, your viewers, okay, this is what this guy thinks. These are his arguments. This is why I think his arguments are wrong right but you're trying to present the scholarship as being absolutely monolithic um when it's not and you're using a source that gives arguments against your own position i mean the quote i gave from you clearly shows that that stewart thinks that the synonymy claim is hogwash it's a it's a myth he says it's a fiction that scholars have just repeat over and over and over again well why doesn't dr ortland mention that i i don't understand he he claims to have read the book so he couldn't have missed it it's all throughout the book. So right. I, I think those reasons, his position is incoherent. It contradicts Protestant denial of sacerdotalism. Um, he's, he it relies on late dating and denial of apostolic authorship, which Dr. Orland doesn't mention, but the scholars he's using rely on that. I mean, Sullivan clearly dates the gospels and the Pauline material late and denies Pauline authorship. Um, that's how you get a developmental theory, right? It was the same. It was the same move that you had early liberal scholars do with the resurrection. Oh, the resurrection is this earlier thing because the Gospel of Mark has a shorter recension, right, and leaves off the resurrection, and then you see this mythological development. Well, that only worked until you thought that the Gospels were composed um, in the second century. But as soon as the John Rylands fragment and other things came along and proved that the entire New Testament was written in the first century, you didn't have time for that longer theory of development to, to take place. And so I would push back on the same basis is you have to subscribe to a liberal um, dating and denial of authorship of these books in order to make your theory work. I don't have that problem. I can accept the New Testament at face value, right? I, I can just accept the Bible for what it claims to be. I can accept these letters for written by Paul for what they say they are. I can take the internal evidence at face value. I don't need to bring naturalistic assumptions to come up with this mythological development hypothesis, which is really what the works that Ortland is depending on, whether they're Catholic scholarship or Protestant scholarship are, are really doing. So in that way, I think the Orthodox wrote and the argument for apostolic succession, I think that rope pulls a lot tighter. Um, and again, lastly, do we have any case of presbyters ordaining the office of a presbyter ordaining in the first 300 years? Do we have any clear and controversial case? No, we don't. Zero. All the ordinations are Episcopal ordinations. And again, the only time it gets challenged, a presbyter starts ordaining is in the fourth century. And there's just not even a debate. It's just like, this dude's doing it. He's nuts. He's excommunicate. We're done. There, there's no prolonged discussion about it. Right. So I, I don't think that his development theory of into the 250s, 300s really will stand up to scrutiny. Um, I don't, and I don't think it's compatible with a conservative understanding of divine inspiration and apostolic authorship. Mm. That's good. Father, I think you were about to say something. I think you're on mute. I'm not muted now. Okay. Uh, so, so Perry, what it sounds like, uh, when, when we get kind of down to a, a summary, if you will, of, of, of what we've spoken about, apostolic succession is something that actually distinguishes us 
scripturally, historically, uh, and almost in any other way, from not only from the Protestants, but because of the scriptural foundations of it and so forth, which we have and they don't, for example, um, it sounds like it not only distinguishes us, and it, but it sets us apart and really then establishes us as the New Testament church. You think that's yeah, I, I, I would say I would say so. I mean, that's one reason why I'm Orthodox, right? I mean, uh, I'm not I'm not here for the smells and bells. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, they're nice, but I'm not here for that. I'm here because I think it's the true church, and I think it's the church that Christ founded. Um, I think that in terms of what sets us apart, it's really it's Christ's way and the apostles' way and, and you know, uh, of and ultimately the Holy Trinity, right? And I'm including Christ and the Holy Trinity, so we're clear. Um, of meaning if, of making it so that the church his people are not a free-for-all it's not a free-for-all you don't get to just go and do whatever and and, and it's chaos god is not a god a, an author of confusion he's a he's a god of of order and um i don't think it's something we need to be nasty about um and you know we have succession and you don't nanner 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 kind of thing um but I, I do think the question that needs to be asked, there are two questions that need to be asked, is what makes a minister and what makes a church? And I know what the Protestant answer will be is wherever two or three are gathered. Um, but really, if you look at that text in scripture, it's talking about the apostles, right? If that's the primary reference, wherever the, the three the apostles are gathered. And you, you see this in church history. You see this in the Fifth Ecumenical Council in their doctrinal decree. They say there's no other way, even though none of the apostles needed each other for the ministry, carrying out of the ministry of their work, okay? Uh, there is no other way to establish a common confession of faith than by coming, the, the apostles coming together and then later on the bishops coming together. The Fifth Ecumenical Council states this expressly. There's no other way. You don't get it by papal decree. You get it through a conciliar model. Um, and in the early church, the bishops were the were the judges, right? It, I you know we have this thing going on with Rome right now, as an aside with the synod, you know the synodality stuff, and they're going and asking lay people for their input and and all this stuff. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, well, that's not the way a synod functions. Like, what what are you what are you putting in the incense over there at the Novus Ordo, dudes? Because <laughs> that's not that's synods. Councils were were done by bishops. Now you had presbyters and deacons, which could be representatives of bishops, and did other work at a council. But the episcopate were the primary teachers of the church, um, because they have that apostolic ministry. So, you know, I think in terms of what sets us apart, I think people really need to ask themselves what in the New Testament, what makes a minister what what makes a church and and is a minister just a layman who's elected by other laymen or is there some kind of qualitative difference so i tell people who are inquirers at my parish um i say look um let's suppose father flapadoodle uh is that's not my priest real name or any priest i know i'm just using it as an example but let's say father flapadoodle is a mediocre preacher and he's a mediocre or a poor administrator okay he's not a priest because he's effective right he's, he's not a priest because he's effective when i was in non-denominational land um many many years ago uh, pastor Jimmy Bob was the pastor because he was more spiritual than other people and he knew more than other people. And the minute you started to know as much as he did, you became a threat because those things are ruled by like one share of towns, right? There ain't, there ain't enough room in this town for the both of us, right? I mean, that that's the way it was. And I grant that the Reformation traditions are different and they're a little better, but at the end of the day, their ministers on their own principles are just elected laymen. And so I would ask people, when you read the New Testament, and you see people like Timothy and Titus and Silvanus and Barnabas acting. Is, is really that, that what you think is going on? 
that's what you think they are? And I think the answer is going to be no. Hmm. Wow. That's good. Let me, let me ask you this. And yes. all right, this is, this is my last, well, I'm not even going to mention any names, but I heard this argument from a okay. Protestant apologist, right? Okay. Um, so Dr. Anonymous, <laughs> Doc, Dr. Anonymous, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give some people a break, uh, even though it's public on the internet, but basically the, so we know that the evidence is clear for, you know, they're, you know, the office of Bishop, but there are some that would say, well, okay, fine. It's there. It's in the fathers. We, we, we see this clearly throughout history. I'll grant the Orthodox that, but they would say it's not necessarily divinely inspired, but it was more so an administrative necessity of uh -huh. some sort. So they try to, you know, they're kind of playing this game where they're, they're not trying to give it like, uh, you know, any divine credit. So they're saying, hey, you know, it was just a necessary thing that we had to kind of do to, you know, keep the show, you know, keep the show on the road, keep it running. Mm -hmm. How would you, what, were your, what are your thoughts on this? How would you respond? Well, the question is, are they at, are they saying that the ministry of Jesus ceased and some other pragmatic accommodation was made? Because that appears to be what their position entails, that the ministry of Jesus ceased. Now, I think if you read the New Testament, you see that the ministry of Jesus continues through the apostles and other people. So I think that would be the 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 first thing. Um, right. Secondly, which like which model is is biblical then, right? Because if you're saying that church hmm. polity or government is just a matter of pragmatic necessity, well, the Presbyterians don't accept that, the Lutherans don't accept that, and the Reformed Baptists don't accept that. So now they're arguing for a position that nobody accepts except maybe the Anabaptists. So I don't think that that's a defensible position from the Reformation perspective. Um, let me let me think here about, uh, there was something else that I wanted to say. Um, oh, that it's, so the objection is that it's just a pragmatic uh, necessity. So I would ask them, well, if we establish that it's apostolic institution, it's instituted by the apostles, um, do, do they have something else that's as an example, that's instituted by the apostles, but it's just a pragmatic, like there's no, nothing spiritual about it or no divine authority attached to it. Oh, I think cool. most Christians intuitions would be if all the apostles taught something and practiced something, you would better do it. Right. Right. Good point. Um, so again, if they want to be in the position of saying, um, all the apostles did this, but we reject it. We're not bound by it. Well, okay, you're free. To, we let you do that in this country. Um, I don't think that's theologically defensible position. Um, right. The other thing is that it denies that ordination conveys anything. And that's one of the underlying assumptions, it seems, of that position. Um, well, that's called begging the question fallacy. So if they're going to claim that it's merely pragmatic, construal, then that's something they need to prove. Um, and they need to prove that this was done for merely pragmatic reasons with no divine sanction at all. And this gets us back to the Jerome text or Jerome series of texts, uh, where Jerome claims that uh, presbyter and bishop are in principle the same with respect to administering the Eucharist, but that only bishops can ordain and that this was instituted by Difference was instituted by the apostles. Um, if it's instituted by the apostles around the time that the Corinthian epistles, it's not a gradual development because I know that this particular apologist, Dr. Anonymous, wants to claim that it's this gradual thing and he <laughs> wants to look at the Latin. Um, I, I don't think the Latin's really going to help him there um, because meaning is use. And Jerome is clearly using it in the sense of something that. Uh, was not directly instituted by Christ, but it was instituted by the apostles. So I think we're still at game over at that point. Right. So, yeah, I, I don't think that the pragmatic claim, uh, the pragmatic claim is the result of 
this entire developmental theory that depends on the synonymy claim. Right, that's it's the end of that discussion. Okay, well, we've already seen that the synonymy claim cannot be proven. Okay, mm -hmm. and that this requires a denial of apostolic authorship and late dating and a number of these other things. If we don't accept those assumptions, then you, we don't reach the pragmatic position. It's right. just not even on the table. That's good. Well said. Terrific. Yeah. Luther, any final thoughts there? No, I mean, uh, per Perry, <laughs> Perry hit it on the nail. He, he's a, uh, he's really a, a sniper when it comes to this stuff. And, uh, <laughs> We are we are definitely we're definitely grateful. That's but no, this was it. this this was amazing. Thank thank you again, uh, Perry Robinson. Uh, always always a treat when we get to chat with you. Uh, we've been uh, thoroughly blessed by you. Uh, for anyone that is listening, if you if you were encouraged by this by uh, just uh, you know Perry's apologetics, we encourage you to check out his uh, material. Um, you know, go on Energetic Possessions YouTube channel subscribe he also has a great blog um and also if you enjoyed this leave a comment let us know what your thoughts were uh but yeah that's that's all i got uh father jonathan any uh, final thoughts uh i was going to say the same thing check out perry's uh, uh blog his his youtube channel uh he's a very very uh educated man and uh knows the 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 mindset the phronima of the church and um there, there are very few that can compete with him and, and with how he presents the case for orthodoxy so uh, I'm, I'm telling the truth barry i've i've, I've yeah it's real tough followed, <laughs> I've, I've followed you for many years before I, I i did any of this stuff so um you you kind of have laced the trail and you've been out there speaking the truth and speaking it very forcefully uh and very uh, energetically uh so i i applaud you for that and, and the the, the, the uh, we, we thank you for that yeah. Well, thank you. It's very kind of you to say. I appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, to Until all our, our, our listeners, and, well, we, we hope you subscribe also to the, the, to the Transfigured Life. Uh, there's more coming. Um, and we thank you for being with us in, in this uh, extended series of episodes for uh, with Perry Robinson on Apostolic Succession. Thank you all very much. God bless you. See you next time. Peace.